<laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. It's not the morning. It is 4.44, or the fours. So, at the brewery today, we've been in, we've moved around the um, whiskey barrels. That's right, the whiskey barrels. And had a bit of a tidy up outside and relocated some bits and bobs and uh, did a little bit of electrical work in the pub and then I've come home and I thought well I've got time to do a vlog because I'm sat in front of the computer anyway and I promised you that I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I want to make a start with but um, I need to give you a little bit of uh, a lowdown on the time scales and how we're going to approach this. So I'm going to do that while partaking in a St. Peter's Golden Ale. And I like to drink beers like this because they're a good palate resetter. It's a good quality beer for a start. St. Peter's make a fantastic beverage. And I do actually really like their best bitter. And uh, somebody recently has been brewing the Five Points Best Bitter on one of the brew tubers, I forget who. And that is my favourite one, commercially available. But St. Peter's is a close second. So anyway, cheers, five o'clock somewhere. Mm. So, I'll let you into a little secret, it's not really a secret. I want to start making some more tanks because we have a little bit of a bottleneck, excuse the pun, in the brewery system where I'm having to refill the HLT uh, after I've mashed in and then I'm relying on the HLT getting back up to temperature before I need to sparge and usually that's not a problem. The HLT has got a 12 kilowatt element in there and it manages to get there with time to spare. The main problem is when I'm chilling at the end of the day I need more water than what the HLT can hold so we're wasting a hundred or two hundred litres of water which I could reclaim because it's already hot I should reclaim so the plan is to rebuild the HLT with a greater capacity than the boil kettle now originally when we made all of these tanks back a few years ago they were just done kind of off the same spec sheet and they were all the same size just so I could uh, mass mass produce them if you like um, without having to think too much about it because obviously I've never done anything like that before. This time round however I would like to make all of the tanks of a size which I think will future-proof the brewery for the next decade or so. So we're going to be upping it to about 10 barrels brewing capacity, which in layman's terms, British barrels are 163 litres. So we're talking 1,630 litres of finished produce. Now, in order to achieve this, I think we'll be looking at tanks, the boiler, for instance, of a capacity around the 2000 litre mark and then we're going to look at what we're going to manufacture this kind of equipment out of and it's obviously stainless steel and stainless steel comes in a set sheet dimension so again there's another restriction so whilst we um, may want to achieve a 2000 litre volume vessel we may find that once we've rolled a cylinder out of the stainless steel sheets that are available, the volume of that cylinder may be a few litres over or under, maybe even as much as a few hundred litres over or under. But we'll work with that. We don't want to be slicing a sliver of steel off just for the sake of hitting an arbitrary target that we've set ourselves. So the plan is to um, have a look what stock sizes there are and work backwards from that and then calculate once we know how much boil volume we will achieve then we'll know 
how big the HLT wants to be to compensate for that. And I'd say about 1.5 times the size of the boil kettle is a good starting point. Might not be the ideal size, but I think that's where I'm going to punt for. And then the mash tun also will be designed on a similar vein. And in order to do that, um, the, and the mash tun and the HLT are going to be different designs altogether, of course. The HLT is going to be a tall, slim cylinder. The mash tun we want to keep as keep the height as restricted as possible to avoid really stuck sticky mashes and having to have long deep mash paddles so the mash tun is going to be a broad shallow vessel whereas the HLT is going to be a tall narrow vessel and the boil kettle somewhere in between and then of course there are fermenters and I would like some pressure vessels and Whilst I could weld these myself, and I believe I've, I'm confident enough to say that I could manufacture them myself, of course, if somebody else is working on those vessels and they explode, then I would be culpable for that. And um, as my welding is self-taught, I think it would be wise for us to hold back on doing something that needed coded welding skills and uh, maybe in the future look at buying these. But I think that a three vessel, maybe even four vessels if we include a cold liquor tank um, build is something that's probably doable in the next year or so provided we don't have any more massive financial surprises. Um, I know it's difficult with the way the world is at the moment to long term plan anything but I'm not going to wait around so let's get stuck in I think a project like this is good for me, you know, mentally and physically, it keeps me interested in what I'm doing. It's good for you because it gives you some content to watch and it's good for the business because it'll open up other avenues where we can start selling our beer a little bit wider afield. So I'm going to spin the camera around, well I say spin the camera around, I'm going to try and do a screen grab of a couple of SketchUp drawings that I've done and talk you through exactly what I've got in mind and these are only brief apart from one um, piece of equipment which is almost ready to go into manufacture and that's the thing that I want to be doing first and you'll see why when I talk about uh, the other vessels in a moment's time so let's see if I can get this machine to work right then folks we should be recording the screen now it's 4.56 on the 2nd of March and it's raining outside, it really is. So first things, we'll, first, there's first, first thing first, we're going to look at the HLT. So here we have the boil kettle, wrong one. Here we have the HLT in SketchUp and I've modelled modeled it out relatively roughly. And you can see that it's approximately three meters tall. Um, manway, conical bottom, conical top, could be dished at the top. Double skin, so as you can see inside we have another cone, uh, cylinder. And that internal cylinder is the tank itself. The external cylinder is the insulation jacket which we will wrap all the way around and make this a really efficient tank what it doesn't show you on here is any outlets or anything like that but it certainly gives you an indication of exactly what it is we're looking to build so on the left hand side we've got a number of measurements and uh, that includes uh, the cone heights and volumes for the um, internal tank, the truncated cone height and volume for the bottom cone on the tank and the height of the cylinders which is obviously like I said three meters so the overall tank height is going to be a little bit higher than that because we've got some legs on there we've also got some um, height about a foot or so 
on each of the cones as well. So it's going to be a little bit bigger than three meters. It's probably going to be closer to four, but of course it's not going to be taking up a huge amount of floor space because it's going to be a tall, narrow tank. And then we're looking at the volume, which is the important numbers. So the volume here is nearly 4,000 liters. And I think that is just the volume of the cone, uh, the cylinder, I keep saying cone. That's just the volume of the cylinder. So we've got the volume of the cones to go in there as well. There's another 200 liters here, and there's another 150 liters on the top truncated cone. So we're looking at closer to 4,001, 4,002. Oh, I've written it down at the bottom, 4,192 litres. I worked out hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the tank to make sure that I'd be able to uh, dimension the materials properly so that the tank didn't burst under its own filled weight. So this, again, if we look at the steel, there will be joints in here. We can't roll this out of one single piece. So it's been designed from the outer jacket being full sheets welded together. And then the inner jacket will consist of sheets that are reduced in size to uh, roll into the desired uh, radius cylinder that we want. And we'll work back for, backwards from that point. But not a cheap tank in terms of materials, but if you was going to have one of these built, I think I'll be making it for about five times less than what you'd expect to pay from a supplier who specialises in this kind of equipment. So that's the HLT. Then we'll move across onto the boil kettle, which is what we've based everything from. And as you can see, the volume on the boil kettle is 2,546 litres down here on the bottom right. The circumference of the boil kettle is 4,000 millimetres, 4 metres. So that means that we can use 2 metre by 1 metre stainless steel sheets to wrap into a cylinder to create uh, a tank body itself. So that would be two sheets of stainless per layer. So four in total per, per stack, if you know what I mean. I don't know if you've seen the Starship that um, SpaceX is building, but think of it like that. You r roll the rings first, and then you stack the rings and weld those together. And that is exactly what we'll be doing here. And then again, We've got cones on the top and cones on the bottom, and this is uh, will be a, a sealed up vessel apart from vent pipes on the top. So we're going to have our steam condenser flue up there still. Same on the HLT; there'll be vent. It will be open to the atmosphere. It won't be a pressure vessel. Of course, if we have a runaway boil situation, that needs to release. So it will be open at the top somewhere. So the contents can escape should they need to. And uh, on the left hand side there are cone dimensions again. And then on this one I've also calculated the hydrostatic pressure. Working backwards from um, a, a density of fluid of 1.1 kilograms per uh, cube or 1100 kilograms per cubic meter which I'm working on it being like one of the strongest beers that we'll ever make in there they say something that's going to come out at 1.100 you know big 10% ABV stouts or something like that the density of the liquid of course means it's heavier which changes your hydrostatic pressure Overall, but let's not get too uh, distracted by those numbers there. The main thing to take away from this is that the total volume of the tank is going to be 2,550 litres, give or take. And that's plenty big enough, considering we're looking for a finished boil uh, product 
volume of 1630 there's plenty of headspace here so that means that there's headspace for thermal expansion of the liquid and also foam during the boiling and uh, that kind of thing and then even extra liquid to compensate for the boil off that we'll have during the boil as well so then if we have a look next at the mash tun you'll see that the mash tun is one meter tall it's just one layer of uh, one ring of stainless steel if you like but the radius on this particular tank is almost a meter in itself which is quite big and that comes from the calculation of three two by one meter sheets of stainless welded end on end to create a one meter by six meter sheet of steel which is then rolled into a ring with a height of one meter a circumference of six meters and a diameter of 1.91 meters or a radius of 95 centimeters again with a truncated cone at the base and a man weight so we can remove the grain without having to shovel it all over the edge um, the volume of the cone is approximately 300 litres and the volume of the tank is approximately 2800 so it's going to give us a 3000 litre mash ton and now that's bigger than the boil kettle simply because at the moment the HLT is a pinch point but so is the mash tun we can't do very big beers and brew at full length and I thought the capacity of the mash tun you know wants to be a little bit bigger than the boil kettle again to allow us to brew some really strong beers in there so much of a muchness um, you've seen them before but this is how we're going to go about figuring out our dimensions for the mash tun and uh, you notice that all of these tanks have a conical bottom and whilst we can roll a cylinder on the slip rollers that we bought for the last project we can't roll cones on it very easily so instead I'm going to build another machine that is going to allow us to press a cone shape out of a cone pattern maybe in two or three two halves or three thirds or four quarters however we decide to divvy it up and cut it out of a sheet of steel so that's going to bring me to my next SketchUp model which is a press break or one might call it a finger break because I'm going to design the ability for the machine to work both ways so a little bit different to a regular press break where the moving arm if you like is at the bottom as opposed to at the top so this will go up and engage with the uh, top of the press break to bend pieces of sheet steel let me just get in there and we'll be able to have a look at how that's going to work so if you look at the <laughs> shape of the dies I'll just put that there for a moment the bottom of uh, the bottom arm that moves up and down is made up of all these 10 mil fingers and these 10 mil fingers hold on a minute don't want to be doing that do I let me just grab one and pull it out here we go now I'm bloody rotating it let's grab it on the corner there we go let's pop him there we can have a look at it so I'm thinking about having these laser cut so we can put as many of them in as we want at a time so you'd remove a certain amount of these if you wanted to fold a pan for instance but if you wanted to bend a full sheet of steel at full length then you just leave all of these dies in so they're designed so the tool itself is multifunctional and we can use it as a as a pan folder or a finger break or a press break with some 
tweaking. So the angle of this um, cutout at the top here is less than 45 degrees, so we can get a minimum of a 45 degree bend in there. And the fingers at the top are the points are far enough spaced apart that it reduces the amount of load required to fully bend a piece of steel up to three millimeters thick which would run the full length of the press brake which I think we've specced out at something like uh, four foot I'm sure it was about four foot 1480 so it's a little bit bigger than four foot and um, the top brace is obviously supported with this little screw down bolt thingy here to tension the top bar should there be any flex in it and the bottom is going to be powered by two 20 ton hydraulic jacks which will eventually when powered hopefully just move in the up and down direction like so uh, being bolted onto this section here and um, yeah allow us to move the bottom plate and do the bending now it would be easier to do it the other way around and have the top plate bending uh, moving to make the bend but the trouble there is we're going to have to sling all of the weight of these jacks up to the top and that means that the whole machine is going to be extremely top heavy and unstable whereas if we do it this way we can mount everything down at the bottom and we'll just have to have some support rollers to hold the workpiece either side whilst we're putting the bends in and also I think it'll be a little bit easier for the bend to like curl up and be controlled in that direction rather than coming down. I don't know, we'll see. But I wanted to show you this, of course, because I'm thinking, does anyone have any ideas that they'd add to this particular build? I mean, I think it's going to do what it says on the tin. Let me see if I can pull one of these fingers out at the top so you can see how they would interact with each other so let me pull this uh, what did I mention do we want to move him at there we go we'll pull him out this way come on he's not wanting to play ball there we go and then if we pull one of the lower fingers out as well got him you'll be able to have a look at these now and how they interact together there we go so let's get it centered in the middle of the screen a little bit so you can see them so the idea is of course we want to get this fella and we want to move him in and out of this bottom section here now I've changed the angle of the top die I haven't changed the angle of the bottom die yet so you'll see that they don't meet perfectly at the moment but this is still a design in progress but you get the idea in fact I'll be doing that the other way actually so the bottom die comes up to meet the top die like so forming the bend and then you'll incrementally go around your pattern line by line to create a conical shape by having the top of the bend radius further apart than the bottom of the bend radius hopefully achieving a uniform conical bend around the cone pattern that you've got there so 
Oh, it's a bit difficult to explain it all off the bat like this, but I think you get the idea. And once we start making this and we, uh, you know, make a few videos on how to how to use the machine, I reckon everybody listening to this video now, if you're interested in a build like this, will very quickly figure out how it works. Something else I wanted to um, talk about as well was this bottom bar, um, which the uh, the jacks sit on, is going to be really big, like five or six inches by two inches of like six mil steel. So it should have a lot of rigidity and not move. And then of course. The two plates that bolt across the front, which hold the fingers in place, again, are going to be about five inches in depth. So they're going to have a lot of uh, st structural resistance to flex in that in that direction. So hopefully we'll be able to put straight bends into material up to two to three meter, uh, millimeters thick without deflection in the center. And also I'd like to have the ability to maybe move the jacks uh, in and out so if we wanted to press a really thick piece of steel we could concentrate all of the pressing power in a slightly more central place to give us more oomph if you know what I mean and then the whole assembly itself all of this bit I wanted to be able to move up and down on the leg supports so when it's not in use we can wind it right down so it's nice and stable on the floor bolt it up in that position and wheel it away against a wall somewhere and nobody will know it's there and I think also whilst we were doing that if we wanted to transport it we could just remove the side legs and fold it all flat and it would flat pack on the on the bed of a transit or something like that and we could move it around so that's my thoughts so in order to manufacture the cones for some tanks like this we've got the heavy equipment already to roll the cylinders we just don't have anything to roll the cones we've got a plasma cutter to cut out holes and everything else that we need we've got a TIG welder to weld the whole shebang together and we've got a workshop to build it in. Probably not be able to stack it that high in a workshop, but we'll have to do all this laid down. But that's the plan, boys and girls. So uh, let me just finish this recording and we'll come back to the phone. So there we go. 20 minutes of me trying to explain how I want these pieces of equipment to work and how we're going to build them. So what do you think? We know it's doable because I've already built some tanks in the past um, in more stressful conditions than this as well. Uh, I really had to get that done while doing a, few, a lot of other things like building a pub. This time round we can do it at our leisure and make sure that it's done to a, a higher spec for a start and I learned a lot on that first build. So hopefully we'll be able to do things like already have planned out on a pattern where all of the outlets and inlets are going to be and we can perhaps cut them flat um, on the sheets of steel before we actually roll them into a cylinder and then we just weld on once it's a cylinder. Little things like that which I think will make life a heck of a lot easier on the final finish. So it will be really handy. If anyone out there has got any experience with press brakes and finger brakes and all that kind of thing, for you to point me in the right direction of maybe some other builds or some videos on what people have um, made in the past. I pretty much scanned YouTube and I've watched most of the press brake videos that I can find on there. Um, there aren't very many pressure vessel or fermenter brewery vessel manufacturing videos online. Something else I also wanted to touch upon, and it's not so important for the brewery tanks, but if we were to make any fermenters, I've been looking at using the press brake as well to manipulate a sheet of stainless steel in order to make a dimple jacket. 
and then we could press break the dimples into it and then roll that with the um, the slip rollers and put that onto the tank as a jacket in its own right. So we'd be able to put a dimple jacket on the stainless steel fermenters, which we weren't able to do originally. So on that note, Abigail's dangling over the edge of the staircase. I imagine she wants some food. So we'll wrap it up. But yeah, any advice? I'd like to hear your thoughts and uh, what you think about me trying to build an even bigger brewery in our little workshop that we've got. Anyway, cheers. I didn't drink the golden ale because I was talking that much. 20 minutes. Oh, it's really nice. Anyway, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.